holy God, you are the maker of all things seen and unseen. We rejoice that you are the savior of all who are near and far. By your spirit, enable us to worship your divine majesty. With all the company of heaven, we magnify your glorious name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you through your word and spirit, you created all things. You revealed your salvation in the whole world by sending Jesus Christ, your word made flesh. Through your spirit, you enable us to share your life and love. Fill us with the vision of your glory that we may always serve and praise you. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But when we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In faith, let us approach God's throne of grace. Let us say the prayer of confession together. Almighty God, we thank you for sending us to make disciples of people from every nation. We confess that sometimes we focus our energies inward and shy away from sharing your good news in word and deed. You charge us to teach your commandments, but we struggle to obey them and model them for others. You assure us of your abiding presence, but we deny the power you give us to work for your purposes in the world. Forgive us, Lord. 
and renew us to be the church you call us to be. Pour out your grace upon us and commission us for service in your name, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God. Welcome to our church service for First Presbyterian Church Springfield on this Sunday, June 7th, which is Trinity Sunday. We're so glad you're able to join us via Facebook. Our worship services will continue online until further notice. Guidance from our PCUSA denominational offices and state government urges this is, continues to urge the suspension of congregational and public gatherings in our church facilities in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. Please just log on to our Facebook page to see what's going on and for our 11 a.m. Sunday services. We will continue the midweek Bible study with Pastor Rosanna on the book of Ruth. The last study will be this Wednesday, June 10th at 2 p.m. There is a Zoom meeting link in the announcement section of your bulletin. Just email Pastor Rosanna or the password. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our Old Testament passage is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings, with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to announce that our adult Sunday school class will resume in a virtual format via Zoom meetings. We will begin on June 21st at our usual time, 9.45 a.m. And to sort of build on the experience you had in Lent with Marjorie Thompson's book, Forgiveness, we will look at um, her recently revised classic book called Soul Feast, An Invitation to the Christian Spiritual Life. And that is a treasure trove of inspiration. And so I look forward to working on that with you. And um, you can read about ordering the book. That information is in your bulletin. And I'm looking forward to it. Young disciples, I want to let you know about something special my son is doing these days. While we're staying inside, uh, we can't go and visit as many places as we might uh, have done in the past. But our son is taking a class on Minecraft. And what they're doing is they're learning about different buildings in the history of the world. For example, Aztec temples and all the way up to the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. And what they're doing is learning about the architecture and then recreating it by building it in Minecraft. And I think it's amazing. We can use our imagination and um, do wonderful things. 
In the Bible, there are specifications for exactly how God wanted the tabernacle to be built, and then at the right time, the temple. And I wanted to show you a picture. This is an artist's rendering of what the Temple of Solomon might have looked like. It's amazing, right? And um, you can read about it in scripture and use your imagination to think about how amazing and wonderful it was. And I actually want to give you a challenge. If any of you would like to recreate a model of the Temple of, of Jerusalem uh, this week and send it to me, I will include it in our worship next week. All that remains right now of that original temple is the Western Wall, um, but we can still think about the amazing thing of God's presence with us wherever we are. Amen. Our New Testament lesson is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 28, beginning at verse 16. Listen for God's word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, and some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today is called Trinity Sunday, and it's the week after God sent the Holy Spirit to the people gathered in Jerusalem on Pentecost. It makes me think of the hymn, Holy, 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 which is based on the passage in Isaiah 6. So even though that passage was not listed for our worship this week, I had a feeling that maybe God wanted me to preach about it. And as I was praying about it, I was reading Psalm 8, and I thought, I'll just read what, Psalm, what Isaiah 6 says. So I placed my hand in the Bible, and uh, it's my Bible that I've had for 25 years, and I turned the page, and it opened right to <laughs> the passage in Isaiah 6. And so I think that, uh, I just took that as a way of God was telling me, yes. Use that passage. Uh -huh. Isaiah's vision of God in the temple in Jerusalem is marvelous. But it got me thinking, why is it that this is considered the prophet's call story when it doesn't happen at the very beginning of the book? We need to look at what happened in chapters 1 through 5 to understand it better. The prophet is talking about God's people in the year 738 before the Common Era, but consider what in this message is speaking to you today. God calls heaven and earth to listen as witnesses. Even though God brought up the covenant people to do what is right, we have rebelled. Those who have enough have not taken care of the poor. We have not heeded the cries of the homeless. People are selfish and deal corruptly overturning what is right. We are confused as we listen to rumors and lies, upending the truth, calling good evil and evil good, putting darkness for light and light for darkness, putting bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Those who have means join house to house and add field to field until there is room for no one but you and you are left to live alone in the midst of the land says Isaiah. Rebellion against God and the ways of righteousness and justice leads to cities burned with fire. Those who have forsaken the Lord, who have despised the Holy One of Israel, are utterly estranged. It's a bleak situation. 
It's a time of strife and struggle. Our human disobedience against God's ways have blocked the flow of help to the vulnerable, have hindered the peace that is meant to reign in a civilized society. Our sin has damaged our relationships with God and with each other. These words resonate with us as we are concerned about racial inequality and the cries for justice during this time of protests with disproportionate consequences of the novel coronavirus pandemic among the Black and Hispanic populations and greater needs due to widespread unemployment. In that time of crisis, God gave Isaiah a vision of God's marvelous, astounding glory. In the temple in Jerusalem, Isaiah saw the hem of God's royal robe filling the sanctuary. The living God is so tremendous that God cannot be contained in any beautiful building, no matter how vast. God is enthroned high above the earth and yet reaches down to be present where God promises to meet us. God allowed Isaiah to see a glimpse of God being praised by the angels, the cherubim and seraphim, winged serpents. God is the Lord of the heavenly host, the massive army or company of angels, who are a multitude more than all the stars in the sky in all the galaxies in the whole universe. The angels continually sing God's praises and announce his holiness. God alone is holy. Yes, truly holy. God is completely holy. God is purely good and altogether righteous. There is smoke representing God's presence, an earthquake trembling and shaking, and the angels' songs of praise fill the air. The angels call back and forth to one another. The whole earth is filled with God's glory. Yes, throughout the entire world, everything living on this planet, people walking and animals moving on the land and rocks, plants growing and insects crawling in the soil, all kinds of living things flourishing and swimming in the waves and the waters of the sea and flying freely in the skies above. All these things were made by God and glorified God. The Creator delights in wonderful simplicity and amazing complexity. I've been learning more in this time by taking MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, and they are being offered for free by Coursera and other learning platforms. And so these days I'm taking a lot of science classes. Mountains 101, Bugs 101, Dino 101, all by the University of Alberta in Canada, as well as Ecology, which is being offered by the American Museum of Natural History, and even Astronomy by the University of Arizona. It's wonderful as each new discovery about the underlying supports and the mathematical harmony of the universe and the history of our planet and the development of all that God has created adds to our wonder at God. Wow, when we recognize how great and good the Lord is, we realize how much we fall short. Oh no. We wonder, what can I do? Like Isaiah, we confess in the words of the message, I'm as good as dead. Every word I've ever spoken is tainted, blasphemous even. And the people I live among talk the same way, using words that corrupt and desecrate. Isaiah wonders, how could I have seen the fringe of God's garment and live? What will happen to me? Isaiah wonders, how could I live after seeing the fringe of God's garment? What will happen to me? God removes his guilt. An angel touches a coal from the incense burning to praise God, 
and places it on his mouth, and he is made clean. Then God lets Isaiah overhear a conversation between God and the heavenly host. Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Encouraged by God's extravagant grace, Isaiah bravely replies, Here I am, send me. And the Lord commissioned him for service, speaking God's word to the people all around. We see that only God can restore us to a right relationship with the Lord. Through Jesus' perfect obedience to God, he willingly endured death on the cross. Because he is God's son, he is the one sinless human who could bear the weight of all of our sin in order to reconcile us to God. And he did. God graciously removes our sin and forgives us completely. In the words of Isaiah 118, Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. All our misdeeds, the words we wish we had never said, our mistakes, our meanness, when we admit our wrongdoing and ask for forgiveness, God takes away our sin and removes them without a trace so that there can be healing in our life and in our relationships with others. People of other religions may believe in God the Creator, but do they know that God is the Savior of the world who loves them? Each person was created in the image of God and is of incalculable worth to God. Jesus Christ died for the sake of the world to redeem humankind and bring everyone close to God. Death could not hold Jesus Christ, the Lord of life. God raised him in the resurrection to live forever. God has changed everything about what we think of as the finality of death through salvation in Jesus Christ. This is the good news that Christians, you and I, each of us have to share. Today's passage in Matthew 28 is called the Great Commission. The risen Christ explained that through his resurrection, God bestowed on him all authority in heaven and on earth. And so those who believe in him are to go. Go make disciples of people of every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that Jesus has commanded. And then Jesus, as he sends us, gives us this beautiful promise. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Notice that Jesus did not say, I will be with you. He said, I am with you. I heard that point made in an excellent sermon for my friend Kurt Heinemann's ordination a few years ago. The sermon was given by the Reverend Dr. Earl Palmer, a trustee of Princeton Seminary, and he was the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, where I was um, growing up under his care uh, way back <laughs> in the 1970s. And my mom was an intern at that church. Earl Palmer wants us to remember what Jesus taught. The truth about our present and ongoing reality is that the risen Christ is present with us in this moment in time and throughout this whole season of our life and into the age to come. How can you and I live into this great commission? Let's tell our neighbors the good news. Through the forgiveness that we have received, we are able to forgive others. The spirit of the risen Christ empowers us to move beyond the past and break the cycle of injury, resentment, retaliation, grudges, and hard-heartedness. 
the healing that the Lord freely gives, is meant to work wonders. And our families will be the better for it. Our friendships will be healed. And we will all receive God's goodness. Let's keep giving generously to the mission and ministries of the church, such as the master's table, by giving practical help through food and financial support to the soup kitchen, and by helping people through the local COPE organization. The love of God is being shared and making a difference in the lives of people in need in our community, and beyond that through our ministries and mission in the world. Like a chain reaction, our acts of compassion, understanding, and kindness, as we reach out to talk with and show love to others, will spark their acts of kindness and reach others into the world and bless the world. For our Confession of Faith today, we will affirm part of the Confession of 1967. The whole theme is reconciliation the healing of relationships. It was written by the Presbyterian Church more than 50 years ago to respond to the need for people in America from different racial backgrounds to be reconciled with one another. It continues to speak to us today in our ongoing commitment to respond in meaningful ways to God's gracious activity in sharing the love of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. I still have a couple more things. Let us affirm our faith using these words from the Confession of 1967. Jesus Christ is God with humankind. He is the eternal Son of the Father, who became human and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the people of the Church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and complete His mission. The work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the Church calls all people to be reconciled to God and to one another. And now let us continue as we lift up our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your presence among us and your guidance in the history of the world. In Jesus Christ, you spoke the word that brought the world into being. By the Holy Spirit, you brought order out of chaos and breathed life into your creatures. In parental love, you stood by us in spite of our disobedience, correcting us with gracious reproof and welcoming us again into your loving presence. To all who believe, Jesus gave power to become your children. In ministry among your own, Jesus cared for all, forgiving their failures, healing their hurts, and nurturing their faith, giving himself in utter sacrifice for those he loved the whole world. He inspired ordinary people to spirit-filled living and displayed in his life, death, and rising again the power of your spirit. We pray especially today for those who bear roles of responsibility in every country. And we lift up all of our local, state, and national leaders that they will work for your purposes of justice and peace. We ask for your special care and protection on all those who work in dangerous places and those who live in, live in war zones. We pray that you will provide for those who are living in refugee camps, in prison, and all those who are staff and patients 
in the medical facilities. We pray that you will bring healing and the conclusion of this pandemic. We thank you for the hope that we have in all the ways that you are at work in our lives. We are grateful for the healing of injuries. We are grateful for people who have received a job after being unemployed. We are grateful for the celebration of birthdays and for all the ways that you bring joy in our life. We lift up our prayers, trusting in your faithfulness as you have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now hear our call to offering. Freely you have received, freely give. Let us return to God the author offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. Let us pray. Bless, O Lord, these gifts given in your name. May they be used to help the spread of the gospel and advance your rule and reign in the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. receive God's blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe in Jesus Christ, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>